everyone. We're doing something a little bit different today and syndicating the inaugural episode from the Asia Research News podcast, which is undertaking a systematic study of how social science research is produced, and distributed and used around the world in a kind of case study basis. And their first episode is about Myanmar. So in this episode, we'll hear from local Myanmar and international researchers studying the issue from the IDRC, the CESD, the SIDA, and the ANU. That's a lot of acronyms. Sit back and enjoy. It's about 20 minutes long, and I'll hand it over now to Laura Peterson. Hello, and welcome to the Asia Research News Podcast. This episode is supported by Canada's Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar Initiative. I'm your host, Laura Peterson. How does a country rebuild its research culture? train capable and independent thinkers, scholars, and investigators, have a government that welcomes expert advice so they can make smart policy decisions based on facts and evidence, not just opinion. It can be a challenge to link science with policy, even in countries known for their top universities and well-funded research programs. But what about in developing countries? The Global Development Network is looking for answers in a unique way. They are taking a big step back to map the social science research landscape one developing country at a time. Today, we're learning about what they've found in Myanmar. Francesco Bino is head of programs at the Global Development Network, or GDN for short. GDN is headquartered in New Delhi, India, and works all over the world. It was born 20 years ago with one ambitious mission to promote the importance of uh, research capacity in social sciences, specifically in development, for development, but also more simply as, um, as development. Francesco and his team developed a framework to systematically look at how social science research is produced, distributed, and used in a country. They call it the doing research assessment. It's only by taking that national view that they can then start to see what investments might actually make a lasting difference. Here's Francesco again. Ultimately, we want to identify levers of change um, within the research system based on the best possible evidence. They have just released the Doing Research Report for Myanmar. It was funded by the International Development Research Center, which has been working in Myanmar for many years. Dr. Nidia Chatterjee is IDRC's Asia Regional Director. This type of systematic exercise allows us to learn about the unique context, the unique knowledge ecosystem in Myanmar. And this type of systematic learning is fundamental to inform our investments in local researchers and in local research capacity building. We'll find out more about some of the report's key findings and recommendations coming up. To understand where we are today, first we need to go back. You see, Myanmar formerly known as Burma, has a vibrant scientific past. In 1910, four scholars established the Burma Research Society. Its goal was the investigation and encouragement of arts, science, and literature in relation to Burma and its neighboring countries. Dr. Zhao Wu is the director of the Center for Economic and Social Development, or CESD, a think tank in Myanmar. This uh, Burma Research Society was uh, established at a time when we were still under the British rule. Burma was a British colony from 1886 to 1948. But nonetheless, I think uh, the researchers who actually collaborated with the BRS in the past did very well. The society helped connect local and international researchers. They published a well-respected journal. The majority of papers were actually about social sciences and humanities. There was great exchange and open debate. Students went to study overseas, and foreigners came to Burma to study and research. The University of Rangoon, today known as the University of Yangon, was founded in 1920 and became one of the best in the British colonies. So this is how, where our research system has thrived at a time when uh, many of our neighboring countries haven't really uh, got into that uh, level of uh, collaboration. After gaining independence in 1948, Burma had a golden age. For the next 14 years, scientific research flourished. Burma was home to many prominent scholars and thinkers. For example, Yu Thant was a high school headmaster, philosopher, and writer, who later went on to become a diplomat. 
He served as the Secretary General of the United Nations for a record 10 years and one month. And check this out. He was also talking about investing in capacity building back in 1962, the year he was sworn in. The time is now ripe for an all-out effort. Training on the spot, training on the job, training of the teachers who will train the teachers themselves. Everything must be done to achieve the maximum effect inherent to the dissemination of knowledge and know-how. Also in 1962, the military took control of the country and implemented a socialist system. This had profound effects on the universities and research culture that last to this day. The government cut off international exchange, wanting to limit Western influence. Universities were broken up into trade schools. There was no more interdisciplinary education. Critical thinking was not encouraged only rote memorization. While there was some social science research, it was only to serve government purposes. Academics became isolated. The Burma Research Society was dissolved in 1980. Fast forward to 1988. Pro-democracy movements gained considerable momentum. A key site was the universities. Students organized mass protests, culminating in nationwide uprisings that brought down the socialist government. But the military quickly suppressed the uprising, and military rule was re-established. Afterwards, campuses were broken up into even smaller compartments to try to limit people congregating. This forced professors to spend hours traveling between classrooms. Academic freedom was further suppressed. Between 1988 and 2000, all universities in Myanmar were closed for a total of 10 years. So you see, the universities and the national research culture were mostly decimated for the better part of 50 years. An entire generation of scholars were never trained in robust research methods. They never had the chance. IDRC's Dr. Chatterjee sums it up well. Decades of systematic underinvestment in research and higher education have eroded Myanmar's previous capacity to generate evidence and advice for public policy. Things have started to change since 2016, when democracy was reinstituted in Myanmar. But the scars of the past are still visible. The road to recovery is steep. We'll find out more about the research landscape and what it looks like today after the break. To assess a country's research landscape, GDN partners with a local think tank. In Myanmar, they partnered with CESD, one of the most well-respected research organizations in the country. Hi everyone, this is Hu Wawin from CESD. Nu Wawin and Zhao U shared some of the key findings from the report during an online webinar in May. They quickly summarized the situation. Bottom line, there are a lot of negatives. Little independent research is produced in the country. What is produced is usually from NGOs like CESD. There is little diffusion or publicizing of research findings and even less uptake or use by policymakers. Here's Nuwa. Right now in the country, popular opinions supersedes the research evidence and policy discussions. For instance, Ministry of Education recently made major policy discussions, uh, major policy decisions uh, based on Facebook response rather than evidence-based uh, review or studies. What's intriguing is that there are actually a large number of social scientists in the country. The majority work at universities and other higher education institutions. Yet, almost none of these academics engage in research. Here's Francesco again. Our most significant learning, perhaps, is that many of the concepts we use in the study terms like research system itself, mentoring, ethics review, peer review, etc., are not familiar ones for all Myanmar researchers. Remember the systematic dismantling of the universities and the shift to rote learning over critical thinking or research? Yeah, this is the result. And rules that remain in place today continue to hinder research. Nuwa highlighted one example. Since most of our researchers are also civil servants, they are also, they have 
to follow the administrative rules and duties. For instance, they have to rotate across higher education institutions nationwide, then it is not easy for them to focus on their long-term research studies. That's on top of horribly outdated infrastructure and limited access to online libraries or databases. So it's easy to see why there's not a lot of research going on in these institutions. Those who do engage in research are mostly at think tanks or other non-governmental organizations, also called NGOs. I'd like to first make note of the increasing numbers of Myanmar nationals who are engaged in INGO and NGO research in Myanmar. That's Dr. Charlotte Galloway, the director of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University. She's been studying Myanmar for 20 years and was an advisor to the report. Though as the DRA findings note, most um, who find employment in these agencies have actually trained overseas. Rarely do we find locally trained university graduates employed within non-government entities as project leads. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves why. And the outcomes of the DRA, in my view, make this quite clear. And the research capabilities of tertiary institutions are very low. No one is blaming the people who work at the universities now, but the importance of the point cannot be overstated. Dr. Katri Pojeleiden is a senior research advisor with the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, or SIDA. She has spent more than 20 years working on research capacity building around the world and is now leading SIDA's efforts to start work in Myanmar. Each country needs its own experts, its own problem formulations, and its own knowledge production, which together forms an intellectual autonomy. Countries need to train a critical mass of independently thinking researchers, or as a Ugandan professor told me when I was living there, growing your own timber. Another key finding from the report is something that anyone looking to do research or support research in Myanmar should take note of. There is some exchange between policymakers and social scientists, but interactions largely depend on personal networks and relationships. This presented a challenge to the researchers doing the report. Here's Dr. Zawu. There are a lot of informality in our research processes, and something like a quantitative uh, surveys cannot really capture a lot of the subtlety of uh, what's going on uh, behind the scenes in the social science landscape. Dr. Galloway has observed how critical these informal networks are for getting research done in Myanmar, but they can slow down the process. And something as simple to many of us as sending out a survey to staff members of a university about research, as it was um, endeavored to happen in this project, needs pre-preparation, as I sort of phrase it. Discussions with the rector, senior staff, getting support. And then it still needs to filter down to staff who will essentially expect permission to contribute, even though there may be no rule that prohibits them from doing so. She also highlighted another ongoing challenge about research in Myanmar. Not everything is up for discussion. I've certainly had it brought to my attention at various times what issues can and cannot be discussed. She believes research produced by local universities won't be considered unbiased and trustworthy until even sensitive issues are open for critical debate. There are signs the government is listening to some experts on some issues. But Dr. Zhao Wu explained it's usually only when the politician has sought out advice on a particular topic. My take on this is that uh, it would be much better if the academy and civil society can also raise certain issues and if they can also conduct uh, evidence and uh, try to advocate the policies to the government. I wonder whether the government is willing to pick up some of these uh, ideas and suggestions. So, so far, uh, the letter is still not yet happening uh, a lot. And then so we are hoping that that will happen in the in the future. Okay, so we've touched a bit on the history to understand how we got to where we are today in Myanmar, and we've covered some of the challenges that researchers continue to face. Now, what to do about it? Dr. Zhao Wu sees this moment as a great opportunity. 
2016, after we have elected the popular democratic government, uh, we have been receiving quite an increased flow of funding to the country. And this, he says, has boosted interest in the research system overall. However, for the most part, there has been no coordination to ensure research funds and efforts are maximized and don't overlap. Therefore, the report strongly recommends better coordination between international donors. But it's not just that international donors need to do a better job working with each other. They also need to revise how they work with local partners. All too often, donors set the research agenda rather than supporting local teams to decide what research would be useful for their country. This, by the way, is not just an issue here. It's been raised in many other developing countries as well. Dr. Zhao Wu explained what it's been like in Myanmar. Uh, basically, I think that the role of the local researcher is more like a celebrated uh, uh, data collectors. So uh, many of us had, uh, uh, were assigned to collect a large amount of data, and then the processing will be done by our international partners. He says leaving locals out of the research design process can have negative consequences. Without local knowledge and local context incorporated from the beginning, studies might not ask the right questions for Myanmar. This makes the results less meaningful for advising policy. Which in a way undermine the, the aid uh, coordination and aid relationship between the donors and our government. So hopefully, uh, I think this is for all common interests for both donors, our government, and uh, the local research community to collaborate more. One area that is absolutely ripe for collaboration is to reinvigorate the nation's university system. While the Myanmar government has significantly increased education funding in recent years, most is for primary education, and hardly any is earmarked for research. There is already a national plan that could help guide this investment. It would directly increase Myanmar's ability to train its own researchers, growing that timber, so to speak. Before we let you go, we want to share one more recommendation from the report. It's pretty exciting. It's about establishing a research council, something reminiscent of the Burma Research Society that could oversee and coordinate research throughout the country and all that international investment coming in. It could drive the research agenda leading the way to the ultimate goal of a self-sustaining, robust research culture. Here's Dr. Zhao Wu one last time. Hopefully, I think our past example of, of a very positive collaboration between the international and local researchers that can be revived, and then now hopefully we can have a much more vibrant and uh, independent research body in the future. So to recap, after years of systematic underinvestment and dismantling of the nation's universities, Myanmar is ready to get back on track. Here are four of the recommendations from the report that we've covered. One, coordinate international investment. Two, work with local researchers from the beginning to design the research agenda. Three, the higher education system is a prime target for investment. And four, establish a national research council. There are, of course, many more recommendations in the Doing Research Myanmar report. To check out the full report, head on over to the GDN website. They're at gdn.int. That's gdn.int. It's well worth the read, and there are quick summaries at the top of each chapter for those who are short on time. The report and this podcast were funded by IDRC and Global Affairs Canada. Edgar Rodriguez helps lead IDRC's work in Myanmar. He explained, IDRC's Knowledge for Democracy Myanmar initiative is a joint initiative with Global Affairs Canada to promote and support public policy research together with a broad range of international and local partners in Myanmar since 2017. The initiative supports capacity building for research through training, think tanks, and joint research projects. During the report unveiling, Edgard introduced the new Canadian ambassador to Myanmar. His Excellency, Mr. Francois Lafreniere. The ambassador emphasized, Canada is committed to independent research and evidence-based decision-making. At the core of Canada's approach, 
to development assistance is a focus on gender equality as one of the most powerful tools for sustainable poverty reduction. We here at Asia Research News have been following along with some of that gender equality research. You can check out articles about a few of the ongoing projects at our website. That's asiaresearchnews.com. And please, we want to hear from you. What did you think of this podcast? What do you think of the report? Are you a social scientist in a developing country and want to do this kind of assessment for your nation? Let us know. Submit your questions and comments to GDN. You can email them at doingresearch at gdn.int. That's doingresearch, all one word, at gdn.int. I'm Laura Peterson. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Laura. And to all of our listeners, we hope you tune in to the next episode coming up, which will be with Dr. Thomas Wells of the University of Melbourne. He'll be discussing the meaning of democracy in the context of the 2020 elections that are just around the corner in Myanmar.